a high school student named Thaku, among many other typical characters who have been isekai in another world, wakes up inside a hospital, feeling a bit giddy, he wonders where he got transported until his painful past rouses him. Following his narrative, he had always been the target of some delinquent students, which turned him into the laughingstock of the school. As a coward and a weakling standing up against the bullies never crossed his mind. He despised himself for lacking the courage and felt the same for the students who turned a blind eye to his suffering. Wallowed in self-pity, he wished to hit the restart button and redo his life. Little did he know that one day he would get summoned into an alternate world as someone dubbed Messiah the Savior. Apparently, a demon lord existed in his new world who played the role of the villain and caused the people's misery. As someone who never dared to take down his bullies, he knew his existence in a fantasy world was a joke. That was until he successfully conjured up magic with the help of Edelweiss, a beautiful saint. Desperate to change his fate, he persevered to overcome his fear, and his hard work paid off. But at what cost exactly? After he got rid of the monsters and the demon lord himself, he was not honored as a hero. Instead, he was labeled as a threat to humanity. For being an otherworlder and defeating the demon lord with his immense power, he was subjected to execution. As the Prime Minister puts it, they should deal with him before he betrays the people and takes over their world. Unable to defend himself with the magic sealing chains gripping his wrist, he started to slowly accept his death. While the spectators roared in rage and the knight drew his sword, Thaku saw Edelweiss, the only person in the crowd, lamenting his ordeal. In the end, neither Japan nor the fantasy world accepted him, but even so, he felt glad that someone shed a tear for him. Back to the present, he struggles to keep his composure as he contemplates his current situation. Skeptical if he really died, he thinks of the possibility that he was only dreaming. To confirm his gut feeling, he gets up from bed until his reflection on the window glass catches him off guard. Seeing a stranger's face, he becomes agitated, which sends him falling to the floor. At that point, he feels discomfort and realizes that his new body has several bone fractures. He immediately casts a recovery spell, and the pain vanishes in seconds. After the successful attempt to use magic, he starts to believe that everything that happened was real, but still, his physical features make him feel otherwise. Suddenly, a doctor and a woman screaming his name, barged into the room. While she hugs him tightly, the doctor cannot wrap his head around the probability that his patient seems fine despite the serious injuries. Upon noticing how the woman reacted, Thaku thinks she might be the mother of the body's owner. Unwilling to reveal the truth about his real identity, he decides to feign memory loss. Later on, he learns that he got hospitalized after falling from the school's rooftop while playing around with his friends. He also discovers that he shares the same first name with his body's owner, but their respective surnames differ. He was a Yamato before, but now, he is a part of the Kusanagi family. Still in awe, the doctor says that even a proficient healer would fail to treat his injuries. When he hears about the healer's existence, he remembers the fantasy world where magic is also a thing. Afterward, Kusanagi's father walks into the scene and pulls him in for a hug. He mutters that he doesn't mind if their son doesn't remember them as long as he is alive and well. Although Thaku is unsure about how he ended up in someone else's body, he is certain that the other Thaku was raised by his family with lots of love. And thus, he promises to give him back his body, one way or another. After the sudden turn of events, the doctor administers all sorts of tests to make sure that he has fully recovered. Once they confirm that he was back in perfect health, he finally got discharged. On the way home, he muses on how advanced the technologies are back in the hospital. Given the scenario that everyone he has met so far speaks Japanese, Thaku is convinced that he is in Japan. As his parents discuss where they should get some takeout food, he recalls that it was the year 2000 when he last saw the Japan he was accustomed to. That said, news flashes on the screen with the reporter revealing that the hot spring of 2040 is about to pass. Surprised to discover the year he is in, he gets more surprised to see goblins and ogres in the breaking news. With the emergence of society's heroes they call hunters, he is left wondering why they exist in the modern world. While he tries to make sense of what is happening, his mother declares that she wants to be a hunter someday. To her dismay, her husband tells her that with her clumsiness, she will die as soon as she sets foot on the battlefield. Immersed in his own thoughts, Thaku watches the hunters use magic freely against the monsters, reminding him again of his previous world. Out of nowhere, a massive crack appears right before their eyes. Panic-stricken, his father desperately turns the wheel, but the guardrail is blocking the way. Thaku then summons a protective barrier, just in time before the road accident impales their car. Fortunately, his confused parents are left unscathed. However, the sense of relief is short-lived when the crack, 
resembling a gate break, throws out some ogres. Having experienced fighting the same monsters back in the kingdom, Thaku knows that ordinary people wouldn't stand a chance against them. For the record, they are no match against his magic, but he worries that he might stick out and hence be taken down again by the people he only wanted to protect. Knowing full well that he cannot afford to waste another chance at life and put someone else's identity at risk, he decides to run, only to witness his parents about to get crushed by an ogre. Out of options, he launches a flare burst, eliminating his prey and saving his terrified parents. He rushes to check on them and claims that a nearby hunter lent them a hand. Even though he managed to protect the two, and they actually believed his alibi, he noticed they had company. As it would seem, after he fired an attack, someone else threw another spell to the ogre. Just then, the worry Thaku catches sight of a mysterious girl with her hand engulfed in flames. With their wrecked car, the Kusanagi family walks home. While they are at it, they speak about the earlier incident, which could have cost them their lives. Thankfully, no casualties were recorded. Minutes later, Thaku's parents welcome their son to his home. Once inside, his mother teaches him how to use a mobile phone as he gets overwhelmed by the advanced technology. As soon as his mother leaves, he searches his room to find anything that can help him know more about Kusanagi, but he fails to find any, not even a diary. To kill some time, he hopes to find an adult magazine at least, only to stumble upon a book about the hunters. Against his wishes, he scans the book. He learns about the hunters holding a ranking system associated with a special report. This makes him think that the hunters are treated as if they are celebrities. If anything, a particular guild piques his interest while browsing the book. For someone who spent three years in a different world, it's safe to say that he is used to encountering strange things, but then operating a mobile phone gives him a hard time. As such, when he receives a new message notification, he almost loses it. Strangely enough, owning an expensive gadget makes him more anxious than facing the demon lord. After unlocking the phone through facial recognition, Messages from a sender named Araki pop up on the screen. Reading the hateful messages, he instantly remembers the bullies in his original world. With Araki's message threatening him once they meet again, Thaku reckons he might be the friend he was playing around with before the accident. As if the message wasn't clear enough that he badly wanted to hurt him, Araki sent a photo while wearing boxing gloves. Well, Thaku isn't intimidated by it, not even a bit, although he feels distressed thinking it's costly to send short messages, let alone a photograph. Hearing him yelling, his mother enters the room, telling him about the Wi-Fi's function, which again throws him into confusion. She apologizes for not knocking on his door and states that living with amnesia can be frustrating. For this reason, she suggests he take some time off before he returns to school. And so, he takes it as an opportunity to look up anything and everything using his phone. Switching to a brief flashback, when Thaku got summoned to the fantasy world 30 years ago, scattered gates or the monster's portals connected the earth and the other world. The monsters wreaked havoc everywhere because the modern weapons were deemed useless against the hideous creatures. It would not last, however. Magicians turned up unexpectedly, and their power gave the monsters a taste of their own medicine. From then on, they passed it off as a skill to the next generation. With everybody capable of learning magic, it became an essential subject, and the monsters started to get defeated. Known as magi, these are the people who study magic, while the frontliners who took down monsters were called hunters. The hunters took the role of tracing gate breaks and dealing with them. While going for a stroll, an old man calls Thaku out as he mistook him for texting while walking. Scratching his head, he strides across the road until he reaches the city center. Looking around, he realizes that modern society has already adapted to magic, although this reality hasn't sunk in him yet. In retrospect, he doesn't really know if he wanted to go back 40 years ago, but somehow he feels lonely. Suddenly, a woman hollers for help because a snatcher runs off with her purse. Thaku notices that the culprit is using magic to boost his speed, even faster than a person riding a bicycle. Using the same technique, physical boost, but with a different caliber, he quickly catches up to the snatcher, leaving the bad guy regretting his decisions. The girl with her kid expresses her gratitude to Thaku for helping them. To add, her child can't help but praise his extremely fast speed for a common technique. Hearing this, he reminds himself not to overdo things next time. The old lady, who almost got knocked out by the snatcher, asks for his hand and gives him some candies to thank him. At that moment, he remembers his grandma, who used to reward him with sweets after giving her a massage. Before they parted ways, he thanked them for making him realize that some things never change. Speaking of which, just as he is about to go home, someone tries to attack him from behind. He effortlessly dodged the punch from none other than Araki, Kusanagi's bully, noticeably pissed at him for ignoring his text messages. Now that he mentioned it, 
Thaku realizes that he is the one in the photo. He calls him by his first name, which makes his blood boil for dropping the honorifics. Acting all high and mighty, Araki reminds Thaku that he is his senior, although the latter couldn't care less about it. Indeed, no matter where he goes, whatever timeline he is thrown into, he always attracts bullies. Araki gives him an earful, blaming him for getting questioned by the police after the rooftop accident. To make matters worse for him, he received a good beating from his father. As he blabs on and on about his unpleasant experience, Thaku is unbothered. Needless to say, he's no longer a scaredy cat when he is around the bullies like him. Looking back, he had faced dragons in the other world, which was a lot scarier than the person standing before him. Despite Araki's loud mouth spitting threats toward him, Thaku sees the former as an angry Pomeranian dog. Unbeknownst to him, he's smiling at the thought. Irked by his reaction, Araki lunges at him, but it's as if he is watching his movement in slow motion. Initially, he plans to make him fall over by stomping the ground in order not to stand out. That said, the second Araki starts to badmouth his parents, Thaku changes his mind as his fist lands a solid hit on his face. Lying on the ground, Araki is fuming, to the point that he resorts to settling the score between them with offensive magic. To his horror, he won't get his chance as a gate break appears right above his head. In a snap, the bloody ogre saves Thaku the trouble of getting rid of the Pomeranian dog. Lucky him, after he was sent flying and crashing into the wall, he is still breathing. Now that he has passed out, Thaku decides to go all out. With one swift move, he sends the ogre to the afterlife. Upon seeing the mess he made, he thinks that he might have gone overboard. He then notices the gate break, still active and open. Since it appears like the summoning skill from his previous world, he tries to close it by destroying the magic circle. Just as the gate disappears, he hears some footsteps approaching, so he rushes to flee the scene. Alongside the authorities, Sakura, the girl who caught a glimpse of Thaku in another gate break incident, finds herself in disbelief, witnessing an ogre one-hitted to death. One of the officers informs her that the monster was already dead when they arrived, and the gate has already been closed. According to the investigation, they found the badly beat Makari unconscious beside the lifeless body of the ogre. He confessed that he was having a fight with a schoolmate, and that he was the one who put the ogre into utter destruction. Hearing the statement, Sakura doesn't believe his claim because he lacks the necessary mana to defeat the monster. Just then, she remembers her encounter with Thaku. Before returning to the Hunter Association, she orders the officer to send her the report later for further investigation. On her way out, the boys can't help but admire her small face. From her striking figure, they also talk about how she had become the youngest S-rank hunter. Despite the soft murmurs filling the area, Sakura is preoccupied with the incident. As an experienced hunter, she knows that it would take several A-rank hunters to obliterate a bloody ogre. With that, she believes that there's an unknown hunter stronger than her hiding in the town. Some days later, at the Kazami High School, Thaku finally returns to class. Seeing the place firsthand, he finds the site more familiar than he had expected. From the looks of it, his overprotective father advised him to take more time before returning to school. For all that, he knows that his real son wouldn't have wanted to repeat another school year due to multiple absences. As he steps inside the school grounds, he dwells on why Kusanagi resolved to end his own life. From being a loner, he realizes that he's no different from his previous self. Setting that aside, he was given another shot at life in an alternate world. There, he wasn't alone because he had Edelweiss who accepted him for who he was. Back then, he told her about his dream of creating a world where everyone could laugh with no pretensions. As her beautiful smiling face fills his imagination, he slaps himself back to reality. Hence, he begins his new journey as a normal high school student. Once inside the room, the homeroom teacher informs the class about Thaku's health condition. He asks them to become his support system as he recovers from his amnesia. Judging by the looks of his classmates, they are utterly shocked. While waiting for their first period teacher, everyone starts to get bored until an annoying voice echoes across the room. Playing the hero, Araki announces that the rumor about him beating a bloody ogre is true. Having said that, the sight of Thaku briefly wipes the smug look on his face as he recalls what really happened that night. He then throws a fit, and Thaku tries his best to ignore him by taking out his phone. Sawa, one of his classmates, approaches him and asks if he's okay. Four eyes definitely surprised him as he did not expect that someone would still talk to Kusanagi. With his reaction befitting a person suffering from amnesia, Sawa reintroduces himself and reveals that they share a common interest. They are both obsessed with hunters. And so, he learns that Kusanagi, at least, has a friend in school. Time passes, and he feels exhausted from information overload. 
With the anxious Sawa in the background, Thaku reflects on how he focused too much on strengthening his physical and mental attributes during his stay in the other world. In other words, he couldn't say the same for his intellectual capacity. He was never a smart student to begin with and he neglected studying. Adding to his frustration, he's not used to reading textbooks through a laptop. As he talks about how complicated the future's teaching techniques are, Sawa assumes that his amnesia is to blame for his strange behavior. Nonetheless, he feels relieved that his friend doesn't seem dejected whatsoever. Thaku then asks him what he thinks about Kusanagi, to which he replies that he is the kindest person in the world. Araki, with his minions, interrupts their conversation, acting all concerned about his condition. The two minions provoke Araki, insinuating that he has changed after getting interrogated by the police. He tries hard to compose himself with all their taunting while Thaku ignores their presence. That is until Sawa asks them if they need his help with their studies, to which they enthusiastically say yes. Smiling from ear to ear, he heads to the library with the trio, leaving Thaku behind. There and then, he knows that something is off. Just as they leave the room, he asks his classmates about it and confirms they are not going to the library. The rooftop is also out of the equation because it has now been blocked off after the incident. One of his classmates mutters that they might have gone to the industrial building behind the school. Thaku storms out of the room, sending his classmates baffled by the sudden change in his personality. At the same time, the trio starts beating the poor Sawa to a pulp. Just as he arrives at the scene, Sawa lies on the ground, writhing in pain. For someone borrowing Kusanagi's body, he doesn't want to interfere with his circumstances, so he refuses to jump straight in. Grabbing Sawa by his hair, Araki calls him an idiot for not asking for his friend's help. For the first time, Thaku agrees with his statement. Even so, he's convinced that Sawa chose to be alone with them to protect his friend. Thaku is itching to save him, but protecting Kusanagi is his top priority. The bullies order Sawa to scream Kusanagi's name to save him, but he turns a deaf ear. At that instant, he confesses that he abandoned Kusanagi even though he's a friend. Now that he's back, alive and well, he can't stomach asking for his help after he had gone through so much on his behalf. To pay for his sin of taking advantage of his kindness, Sawa resolves to suffer alone. This time, he vows to save his friend. Interestingly enough, Thaku feels a sudden tightness in his chest, making him wonder why he's feeling someone else's pain. Talking about pain, Sawa continues to be a punching bag as Araki declares that they came to play, not to study. Having had enough of the latter's atrocities, Thaku comes out of his hiding spot and volunteers to be their next playmate. Wearing the same smug look as Araki, his two minions laugh off Thaku's grand entrance. Contrary to their actions, their leader keeps his guard up. Ultimately, Sawa loses consciousness, and thus, they mock him for being weak. Thaku disagrees and says his friend is strong as he applies a healing spell to his badly injured body. The two then proceed to mock him for being delusional, only for the baldy's face to be crushed like a tin can after receiving a solid right hook. Joining him on the ground is his duo, who unintentionally bites his tongue after getting kicked in the face. Enraged, they join forces to take him down, only to get their empty heads crashing into each other. Araki intervenes, but he easily gets pinned down on the ground. Much to Thaku's surprise, they refuse to wave the white flag as they conjure up magic circles. Truth be told, it cannot be denied that they share the same brain cells with Araki. As it seems, the fact that they are resisting makes things easier for Thaku. He recalls the time when he made a grave mistake during the war with the Demon Lord's army. He annihilated the enemies, but when a lone survivor claimed that the Demon Lord was only forcing him against his own will, Thaku couldn't bring himself to kill him. As a consequence of letting him go, an entire village was destroyed and turned into a ghost town. For all that, he learned his lesson, and that is to finish what he started, and he plans to apply it to the good-for-nothing bullies. Just as he's about to break their will, the two become hysterical. Turns out that a blue gate appears and spits out an ogre almost immediately. Thaku, looking all calm and collected, notes that the most dangerous monster that can come out of a blue gate is an ogre. Araki's minions run to him and request their leader to defeat the monster since he had single-handedly beaten a bloody ogre. Well, a look on his face says it all. Rather than expose the truth and be humiliated in front of his minions, he stands up and launches a fireball. To his dismay, he just humiliated himself as the ogre effortlessly shoved his fireball like it was a cotton ball. As a response, the ogre sends him flying into midair, and his supposed-to-be friends leave him behind. The monster then shifts its attention to Thaku, who summons multiple fireballs at once. With quick work, his target has been reduced to ashes, calling Thaku a monster himself. Araki can barely speak as the person he used to bully walks toward him. Things take an unexpected turn when Thaku heals Araki. With a single tap on the ground, he makes it crumble, 
scaring the living daylights out of him. Thaku then asks Araki to continue his act and claims that he defeated another ogre for the sake of keeping a low profile. Without any eyewitnesses, he is convinced that no one would know. For his final order, he instructs him to leave him and Sawa alone. The same goes for his minions, as he stresses they stop bullying other people in the first place. Should Araki cause any more trouble, Thaku promises that he won't like how things would end for him and his friends. In a short while, the hunters arrive at the scene. Thaku quickly takes Sawa out and reminds Araki to play his part well in deceiving them. Sometime later, at the Aran Academy, a hunter training technical school managed by the Hunter Association, the hunter dispatched at the Kazami High School reports to Sakura about the gate break. She admits that everything had been dealt with when she arrived at the scene. Seeing her superior wearing a deadpan expression with her report, she apologizes for her incompetence. After that, she shares that she doesn't believe the person claiming to be the slayer of the ogre. Just like Sakura, she had observed that the remnants of the mana left on the scene were beyond a typical human's output. Alarmed, she says that whoever's responsible for the incident possesses a monstrous presence. Seeing her subordinate scared, she decides to take over the case. Before leaving, her subordinate expresses her admiration for Sakura, shouting how cool and beautiful she is. Crouching in embarrassment, she hates how everyone around her keeps praising her for her physical features. For what it's worth, all she wants is to do her job as a hunter and not let her skills and talent go unnoticed because of her appearance. A while later, she lifts her head up and recalls the report about Araki getting involved in an argument with someone. With Araki taken out of the picture as the monster, she's determined to find that someone and get the answer to all her questions. To start, she plans to talk to Araki personally, hoping to learn the truth, not only to prove herself but for the sake of her family as well. The next morning, Sakura arrives at Kazami High School to hunt down the person she labels as irregular. Funnily enough, Sawa's eyeglasses chatter into pieces at the sight of Araki, sporting a different character, far from his barbaric self. While his minions poke fun at him, the rest of the students can't believe their eyes. When the chaotic duo takes notice of Sawa, Araki quickly drives them away before they get into trouble. Thaku then arrives and greets his friend. He asks about his injuries to which he says that he got them after falling off the stairs. Talking to himself, Thaku admits that he wanted to heal all his injuries, but then he remembered the doctor's claim about the limits of proficient healers. Both acting clueless about what happened yesterday, they talk about what they did after school. When Sawa asks about Raki's strange character development, Thaku suggests they leak him be. Once inside the school premises, Sakura wanders around and runs into students practicing magic. She witnesses someone messing up a spell, accidentally burning the teacher's hair. At present, the Hunter Association is in charge of managing all the hunters. In connection, she remembers her target, who has been walking freely around the town. With that much power, she worries about what that person could do. She adds that even managed hunters make a scene sometimes, turning her more desperate to catch the irregular. Calling her Valkyrie, Orachi, an S-rank hunter, asks Sakura why she's in Kazami High School. Sharing the same sentiments, she asks him the same question. It appears that Orachi is a guild master of the Auroboros Guild who is in charge of the Takai region. When asked if it's okay that he left his guild members by themselves, he says he has excellent people who can fight on their own. As the tension rises between the two, Sakura notes that the Auroboros Guild is known for their aggressive scouting methods. She proceeds to question him about his guild's attempt to acquire more power by running around recently. Neither did he deny nor confirm her accusations. When she asks him if he also fears the god of war, he remains nonchalant, calling such righteous idiots. He stresses that they don't really meddle in conflicts between guilds. Sakura reminds him that protecting the people is their primary responsibility and getting involved in conflicts between guilds is always a choice. As a response, Orochi asserts that to maintain order, they need a more powerful leader than the Hunters Association. Getting on each other's nerves, the two S-rank hunters stare daggers at each other. While Sakura has already suspected that Orochi is there for the same reason, she did not expect that he would make an uproar to lure out the irregular. She tries to stop him but to no avail. That is until a gate break pops up, acting out in his stead. In haste, the students run off to evacuate. Sakura asks Orochi to help her deal with the situation, but he is not interested in a blue gate calling it a small fry. And so, the self-proclaimed Japan's finest S-rank hunter leaves her alone. Before returning to the guild, he muses on how strong the magic power he felt when the gate broke. With someone possessing the ability to wipe off any trace to blend with others effectively, he's convinced that a monster is on the loose. Meanwhile, 
Inside the school building, the skeletons and ghouls have begun chasing down the students. Fortunately, Sakura arrives just in time to save them, although she is clearly outnumbered. Enhancing her ability with lightning boost, she saves a girl who almost got chewed to death. There she goes, leaving everyone's jaws dropped open. As the students still stare at her in awe, she commands them to evacuate, assuring them that she will take care of the monsters. Amidst the disturbance, some students choose to stay to fight alongside her. Turns out that the skeletons and ghouls are the lowest rank monsters, so she's not that worried about the students' safety. That said, the Will-O-Wisps pose a threat because they can use magic, but there are only a few of them. Sakura then rushes to where she detects an immense amount of mana. Much to her surprise, a sacred circle welcomes her sight, summoned by who she believes is the one she's been looking for. Using the sacred circle, Thaku successfully eliminates all the monsters in one go. Just as he's about to finish things off, Sakura calls for his attention. He immediately closes the gate and escapes with his physical boost. Equipping herself with the lightning boost, she chases after him but somehow her technique, which grants its user more speed than physical boost, is being overpowered. Thaku could go faster if he wanted to, but his technique is only capable of enhancing the user's physical abilities. Inside Kusanagi's weak body, he can only do so much. Hence, he plans to train and strengthen his physical attributes. He promises not to overdo it so he won't end up looking like a titan. Minutes later, he resorts to using the aerial boost, and before Sekira knows it, he vanishes into thin air. With that, she stops running after him for the time being. Once Thaku is far enough from school, he finally lets his guard down. Following the incident, he plans to go back to school tomorrow, as he is sure they won't resume today's classes. Thinking about his pursuer, he believes that she is a hunter, although her appearance does not live up to his expectations. In comparison to his previous world, he expected that the hunters would at least look like gallant knights or high-rank adventurers. As soon as he's back home, his mother hugs him tightly, feeling relieved that her son is fine after catching the news that monsters appeared in his school. She says she's been trying to contact him, but he won't answer the call. He actually has no idea where he could have dropped his phone. His mother then tells him that a friend of his brought back his phone and is waiting in the living room. While he expects to see Sawa, Sakura greets him with a smile. Seeing her again, he starts sweating bullets as she thanks him for earlier. At that point, he confirms that she's the hunter pursuing him a while ago. In exchange for returning his phone, Sakura cuts to the chase that she needs answers from the recent gate break incidents. As she mentions all his doings, he tries to compose himself by flashing a fake smile. He admits that there's no point in running away, however, they can't openly talk about it in the living room. With his mother getting the wrong idea, he invites her to talk inside his room. Further fueling the misunderstanding, his supportive mother offers to buy them a cake. Soon enough, they find themselves alone inside his room. The cake did not make it as Thaku served her some black tea. Despite the air of awkwardness between them, he tries to make her feel comfortable. Not in the mood for a small talk, Sakura asks him upfront about who he really is. She threatens to restrain him should he not cooperate or lie about his identity. While he counts Akari as a Pomeranian dog, he sees Sakura as a beautiful wild boar. Walking on eggshells, he wonders if she will believe his story as a hero from a different world, or if she will think he's just messing around. As Thaku refuses to speak, Sakura lunges at him, restraining him in the process. In his defense, he confesses that he isn't a bad guy. He even uses his amnesia as an excuse to prove his innocence. When asked how he can use advanced magic spells and how he is so calm when facing monsters, he claims that he's able to do it for no apparent reason. Hearing his own answer, he knows she's not buying his excuse. He then tells her that he's not just hiding his power because he is also scared to use it. Still pinning Thaku against the wall, Sakura declares that with his power, he can perform hunter activities at the highest level. He makes it clear that he has no intention of becoming a hunter. From rising in social status to earning fame and other privileges, Thaku, who knows better, informs Takira that he doesn't need all those things. In fact, all he wanted was to live a peaceful life, nothing more, nothing less. And just like that, Sakura steps back and removes the restraints. She assures him that as long as he doesn't use his power to hurt others, the Hunter's Association will not get in his way. For the most part, she believed him, and he can't believe she just did. Looking back at his involvement with the gate breaks, Sakura notes that all he did was protect others. As if she flipped a switch, she apologizes for running after him earlier and for treating him violently inside his own house. He also apologizes to her for his suspicious actions. Even though she acknowledges his strength, she stresses that he sucks at setting up his phone's password with four zeros. After cracking the code, everything fell into place, 
which made it easier for her to track him down. Before she leaves, she confesses that she became a hunter for people to live in peace. Thaku's power aside, she vows to protect his peaceful life at all costs. As she walks away after her touching speech, she reminds him of Edelweiss. Blocks away from his house, Sakura looks at Thaku's contact information. Just to be on the safe side, she saved it. Although he still struggles to understand all the functions of his phone. Little did she know she was smiling at the thought of him being naive and mysterious. Just then, the old man resurfaces and scolds Sakura for using her phone while walking. The next day, the huge LED display in the streets flashes a C-rank hunter party known as Windguard. It appears that the residents have taken a liking to the party as they dub them as local heroes. Thaku, passing by with his morning jog, overhears some people arguing about who's the cutest member of the party. Because of the gate break, Hizami High School is temporarily closed down, giving him time to enjoy his morning routine. Back in his previous world, his mentor would always keep a close watch on him while he was training with a sword beside him. It was nerve-wracking, but in the end, it helped him strengthen his body. Suddenly, a commotion nearby draws his attention. By the looks of it, the people are spectating on a black gate. As he puts it, it takes time for a black gate to break open before the strong monsters emerge from it. To close the gate, the boss monster inside must be defeated. Seeing the people flocking around the gate makes him think they are waiting for hunters to deal with it. For a second, he wonders if Sakura will show up. Looking at the portal, he considers jumping straight to it to confirm if it's the path to the world he knows. Shortly someone taps his shoulder and tells him he doesn't have to worry anymore because they have arrived. Turns out that it's the Wind Guard, the party the people have been waiting for. Chika, one of its members, apologizes on behalf of their guild leader, Mamoru, for being extremely loud. The other two members, Yuchai and Matsuri, come into view. The former urges their leader to tone his voice down, while the latter mentions that his loudness is one of his good points. Speaking of being loud, the crowd roars upon the arrival of the local heroes. For the second time, Mamoru almost breaks Thaku's eardrums as he assures him that they will destroy the gate and protect him and the townspeople. Wishing them good luck as they enter the gate, he remembers his mentor again, Grotto, the Kingdom Army's general, who bears a striking resemblance to Mamoru. During their training, Thaku never landed a strike against his mentor. Every time he would see an opening, Grotto was always a step ahead, and thus, he claimed victory over the Messiah. With Thaku covering his ears because of his loud voice, the general told him that he was chosen by God for a reason. Despite the one-sided battle, Grotto commended his impressive growth in both physical prowess and magical abilities. With a long face, Thaku asked the general why he couldn't land a hit if he was improving in the first place. Grotto reminded him that a powerful attack would always leave a window, so it solely depends on the swordsman's timing and precision. In the middle of the pep talk, a demon appeared. Puzzled at how the demon made it inside the stronghold surrounded by several guards, the monster showed Grotto its power by cutting off his left arm. Horrified, Thaku couldn't move. Out of desperation, Grotto resolved to fight the demon alone and asked Thaku to run away. As he refused to abandon him, the general told him that he couldn't bear losing someone he treats as his grandchild. After losing his wife and son, unwilling to use Grotto as a decoy to save his own life, Thaku mustered all his courage, and with one swing of his sword, the demon perished. Soon afterward, he told the general that he also wouldn't be able to take it if he lost the closest thing he had to a grandpa. As he avoided looking at Grotto's face turning emotional, he asked about his opinion about his decisive slash. Balling his eyes out, the general gave him a score of 500 billion. Overflowing with emotions, he almost forgot that he was profusely bleeding from losing an arm. Back to the present, it's been three hours since the wind guard broke into the black gate. He just finished his workout when another ruckus grabbed his attention. Back at the same spot, he hears Mamoru screaming Chika's name, revealing the members in distress and suffering from serious injuries. As it seems, Chika used herself as a decoy to let the other members escape. Barely gathering his wits himself, Yuchai stops Mamoru from doing anything reckless. To make him feel any better, he says Chika is the most agile among them, so she should be fine. Left with no choice but to wait for the rescue team, the people start to become frantic because the monsters might walk out of the gate at any moment. Feeling helpless, Mamoru slumps to the ground and apologizes to Chika for being a weak leader. Looking at the trio trembling in fear, Thaku decides to wait a little more time until help arrives. Much to his shock, he unconsciously enters the gate. While he's unsure how he ended up there, he's certain that if Grotto and Edelweiss were watching him right now, they'd be laughing at his stupidity because they saw it coming. Hearing Mamoru still shouting Chika's name outside, 
he covers his face with the hood of his sweatshirt and gets down to business. While he's at it, an elf maiden, sitting comfortably on an ogre's shoulder, feels delighted that another prey enters her domain. Running in the forest, Thaku feels somewhat nostalgic as the place and the monsters he encountered remind him of the alternate world. After some time, he comes across Mamoru's now broken shield, leading him rushing to find Chika. Thankfully, she is still alive. Gasping for breath, Chika runs for her life as a cyclops chases after her. Alone, she couldn't stop thinking about her comrades, worried if they managed to escape. Distracted, the cyclops catches up to her, causing her to trip and fall to the ground. Luckily, Thaku arrives just in time, freezing the cyclops' body entirely. After shattering the ice, he immediately checks on Chika and feels relieved that she only has bruises. Still shaking, she thanked him for saving her. He claims he's just a passerby, but Chika recognizes him as the child they met earlier because of his outfit. It is then revealed that she keeps track of everything around her because she's a scout person. Thaku compliments her good memory and quickly shifts the topic to the Cyclops. Upon confirming that it's the boss monster, he suggests they lead the place at once because her friends are worried about her. Chika sheds a tear after knowing that they made it out alive. Elsewhere, the elf maiden starts to make her move. While searching for the exit, Chika wonders how Thaku cast the freeze spell earlier without using any tools to enhance his magic power. Aside from that, seeing his outfit looking like he's on his way to a convenience store doesn't add up to a kid who dares to enter a black gate alone. Engrossed in her own thoughts about his identity, her head crashes on his back. He then grabs her knife and launches an attack to stop a magic beam coming from up above. Although he manages to penetrate the enemy's spell, he misses his target. With rescuing Chika as his only objective, he lifts her up with a princess carry and runs off. From countering the magic beam to blasting off like a rocket, the elf maiden takes an interest in Thaku. He apologizes to Chika for destroying her knife and promises to pay for it if his allowance will allow it. Screaming her lungs out, she says she doesn't care about it. As they approach the gate, Thaku asks if she has any item that can obscure the area once they get out, to which she says she has a smoke screen. Before they leave, he requests she keep his identity a secret. For saving her, it's the least that she can do. The elf maiden just finished accumulating enough mana to fire another magic beam, but the joke's on her, they finally escape, hence dodging her attack. After throwing a tantrum, she mutters that she will come after them. She tries to follow the two, but the gate won't allow her, leaving her sulking. On the other hand, Chika finally reunites with her comrades, with Thaku watching them from a distance. With Kazami High School, still undergoing renovation after the gate break, Thaku, Sawa, and Araki find themselves grouped as the three students who will be absorbed by the Aran Academy until the school repairs are finished. Surrounded by hunters as their new classmates, the trio does not know exactly what to feel. Judging by how things seem to be, the hunter training schools allocated spaces for the students affected by the gate break. To ensure that the learning will not be compromised, the class material will be aligned with the school's program. From feeling doubtful, Sawa now feels excited to be studying at Aran Academy, basically like an intern. That said, his expression changes when he remembers that Araki is with them. Thaku assures his friend he won't cause any trouble, especially inside a prestigious academy. Back to his usual self, Sawa can't contain his excitement to meet Sakura and other elite hunters who graduated from the academy. Giving the place a quick tour, Sawa can't stop talking about the academy's reputation for producing high-rank hunters. Looking around, Thaku notices that all the students carry weapons, suggesting they are prepared if a gate break strikes at any second. Sawa speaks about Sakura again, asking his friend if they have already met. He brings up the case of his missing phone and how she asked for Thaku's address to give it back to him. He tells him that she's a nice person for going through all the trouble of returning his phone to his house. Sawa teases him, asking if they have exchanged contact information. As expected, he denies it because he is well aware it won't do him any good if it spreads out. If anything, Sawa warns him to be careful because of Sakura's extreme fan club. Speaking of which, she shows up in the hallway with everyone's eyes glued to her. Eventually their eyes meet, and while she ignores the people around her, she smiles at Thaku. Before Sawa confronts him about what happened, he walks with a distance eating stride towards the cafeteria. At the same time, someone is spotted smirking in the background. Later on, Sakura summons Thaku into her office to show him the video clip of Chika's interview. She kept her word and did not reveal his name nor describe his physical features. As the footage ends, Chika expresses how grateful she is for his help and calls him her savior. With her eyes squinting, Sakura alerts Thaku that there's a limit to how much she can cover up for him. She adds that the Hunters Association is in a state of tumult. According to her, 
the black gate from the incident was supposed to be a D rank, and with the C rank party dispersed in the area, they should have dealt with the situation in 10 minutes. Even more so, they went up against a Cyclops, an A rank monster. With all the inconsistencies, the involvement of an irregular who is not registered with the association only worsens the situation. Although Sakura and Chika know he isn't a bad guy, the rest of the world has no idea if he's a friend or a foe. Another matter that concerns Sakura is the elf maiden Thaku reported as a high rank monster capable of unleashing a powerful magic beam. Despite the stress he has brought to her and the association, she apologizes for partly blaming him for the issues. Having saved someone in danger, Sakura tells him he did the right thing. Before she lets him go, she reminds him that no matter how strong he is in her eyes, he's still a normal citizen. She promises to fulfill her duty as a protector of his peaceful life. She requests Thaku to let them, the hunters, take on the dangerous missions, not only for his well-being but also for his family's sake. On the way home, it finally made sense to him why Sakura has a fan club, given her innately kind disposition in life. Coincidentally enough, just as she told him to stay away from the monsters, they always find a way to meet him. By good luck, the hunters turn up to protect him, or more accurately, save him from going against his word. As he stands as an onlooker, four hunters charge at the goblins while their last member tears down the ogre. Talking about first impressions, Thaku finds the blonde guy, the same person smirking in the hallway, quite flashy. He thanks him not only for saving him, but also for leaving his uniform safe from blood stains. Looking at him closely, the blonde guy recognizes Thaku. Oddly enough, the hunters gather and form a position as if they are about to do a production number. He then calls Thaku by his full name, stating that it's proof of his affection towards him as his future comrade. His underlings introduce him as Soma, a young genius in the field of spearmanship and an A-rank hunter. Lastly, he reveals that he's the president of Sakura's fan club, Power in Society. Meeting them in the flesh, Thaku wished he had taken a detour instead. As he stands there looking like a statue, Soma assumes he is dead curious about the Auron Society. Sakura's number one simp explains that the fan club was built to admire her goddess-like beauty. Those who adore her join together, composing the school's largest guild that protects the peace of the general public. Hearing this, Thaku is surprised to learn that it's not just a typical fan club. Soma highlights that the only requirement to be one of them is to love and respect Sakura, regardless if someone is a hunter, a magus, or a normal citizen. He claims that Thaku's passionate gaze during lunch break makes him the perfect fit to be part of the hour in society. While he keeps silent about it, he finally speaks when Soma mentions his calmness when he stumbled upon a monster. Thaku clears the air, saying that it's not a strange behavior, instead, he's just shocked, and the weight of the situation didn't register. Sakura then turns up to check the status of the gate break. Thaku shares that the monsters have already been taken care of by the hunters, who suddenly disappear without a trace. The next day, Thaku cannot stop thinking about the people he met yesterday. As much as possible, he doesn't want to get involved with them in any way. With the existence of a huge guild simping over Sakura, he can't deny the fact that her influence is not a joke. While he hopes to avoid them, Soma greets him with an ominous smile. Thaku suggests he stop following him around, only to realize that he is actually his classmate, much to his dismay. Starting his day in a bad mood, Thaku cannot even concentrate in class as Soma literally keeps watching his every move. From the classroom to the cafeteria, the strange guy won't even let him enjoy his meal. Trying to ignore his stares, he asks Sawa about Soma. He states that their classmate is the successor of a famous spearmanship household that has been around for over a thousand years. He earned the title of a child prodigy for his great talent. As someone who shares the same age with them, Soma is a top-tier hunter, who made it in the list of the top five A-rank hunters in Auron Academy. Sawa admits he can be erratic, but his excellent skills and achievements make up for it. Some time later, at the training ground within the academy, Gori, their PE teacher, welcomes the students in his class. As their screams fill the stadium, Thaku wonders what makes them so passionate about a PE lesson. Sawa informs him that it's not just a typical practical skills test, but a hunter training. He states that the training can only be possible if someone from the association permits it. To think that they, coming from a normal school, would get a chance to experience it, he couldn't be any happier. With his eyes gleaming, Sawa points at the equipment they use in training. The DS house, a mini house on top of a tank, producing DS monsters or the doppelganger slimes. The slimes can change according to whatever data gets input into the program. Thaku did not expect that the slime could do such, 
leaving him wondering if the students would be alright. Sawa assures him they are safe because they will only spar with pseudo-monsters made by Amagus. From the people making advanced technologies to the Magi developing such magical tools, his new world keeps surprising him. The training begins, and Gori guides the students as they face the DS monsters. While observing how the students take the training seriously like firefighters, Araki mumbles that there is no way Thaku would be in danger in the training. He calls for his attention with his evil smile, and it's enough for him to back off, frustrated that he cannot do anything. Meanwhile, Soma, having his main character moment, eliminates the DS monsters with a flashy technique, sending Sawa fanboy. Soon enough, the boys from Kazami High School are called for their turn. While they are up against three DS goblins, the students cheer for the trio as Gori asks them to pick any weapon of their liking. He strongly recommends the sword for starters. Thaku takes a sword, claiming he is not confident with his magical ability. Sawa and Araki refuse to take anything as they rely on their magic power alone. Gori instructs them to aim for the monster's neck because it's their weak point until the DS goblins finally attack them. Sawa and Araki manage to defeat their opponents with the fireball spell. Thaku, on the other hand, stands still, confusing everyone as to why he did not even move. Sawa encourages him and stresses that the DS goblins only pretend to attack. Thaku makes it clear that he slashed his opponent, and not long after, the goblin's head fell off. Murmurs fill the training ground as the confused students wonder if he really swung his sword or the DS house bugged out. As expected, Thaku plays dumb, and with the helpless Araki playing along, they try to convince everyone that the DS house is broken. Along with the other students who start to believe their claim, Sawa is left confused about Thaku and Araki getting along. Switching to Soma, he thinks otherwise. Some time later, Thaku is seen inside the library bored to death. He failed to find any book that could help him return his body to its original owner. If anything, Sawa handed him a magazine that could probably give him a clue. On the cover is Kikeo, better known as the God of War. Japan's strongest hunter who fights by possessing heroic spirits. Thaku finds the heroic possession somewhat similar to his situation. However, he didn't take Kusanagi's body on purpose, and Kikeo's soul remains intact, that of herself. As he ponders the probability that the other Thaku is the same case, Soma interrupts him. After apologizing for startling him, he gets to the point and asks Thaku if he's hiding his true power. Soma notes that he's good at judging people's abilities, although he can't perceive the full potential of his power. Thaku stresses that he's nothing but a normal student suffering from memory loss, but unfortunately, Soma doesn't buy it. Talking about being random, from a Pomeranian dog to a wild boar, Thaku sees Soma as a carrot. Soma expresses his interest in his strength. He is fairly certain that he is above the master's level. Wearing his signature smirk, he wishes to spar with him sometime, but Thaku reiterates that he's just a normal student. Soma's attention shifts to the magazine he's reading. He shares that Kikeo is a top-class hunter, and he had the opportunity to duel with her, only to suffer a crushing defeat. From how he acted unconcerned about the carrot guy's thoughts, Thaku stands from his seat and asks him if he can meet Kikeo. Soma mentions that they had a gathering of martial artists at his place, but she had already left. He adds that the god of war is usually holed up on the grounds of the sacred mountain. Having said that, Soma claims that if he uses his family's connections, meeting her might be possible. Again, Thaku goes out of his character out of excitement meeting Kikayo. Soma takes his desperation as an excellent opportunity to get what he wants. In exchange for helping Thaku, he has to showcase his abilities in a duel. Later on, the two head on to one of the few black gates that are being preserved on the academy grounds. With a special magic seal placed on the source or the boss monster, the students use the space for training. As an A-rank hunter, Soma doesn't need to ask for the higher-up's permission. He can enter the gates anytime he feels like it. Not giving any attention to the great bull raging behind him, Soma can't wait for their mock battle. As a condition for agreeing to his terms, Thaku demands he introduce him to Kikeo and not talk about his power to anyone. He promises to keep his word, and in a short while, the duel begins. Soma initiates the battle, with Thaku dodging all his attacks with ease. Thaku attempts to retaliate, but his opponent blocks it, surprising him a little. Soma keeps throwing aggressive charges, but still, no one has yet to draw the first blood. Despite his condescending attitude, Thaku acknowledges his strength. Having had enough of Soma's blabbering that ruins the elegance of his technique, Thaku warns him to evade his final slash. For a second, Soma sees his head falling off the floor, an illusion caused by bloodlust. With his opponent distracted, Thaku goes for a foot sweep, hence ending the duel in his favor. Soma slowly gets back on his knees, telling how amazing Thaku is. He even acknowledges that he is above his rank after all. 
Still thirsting for more action, Soma requests another round. That is until the great bull breaks out of its restraints and transforms into a minotaur. Anxious, Soma can't believe the great bull can evolve into a different species. As Thaku prepares to take the monster down himself, Soma gets in his way and declares that he will hold it off so he can escape. He tries to lend him a hand, but he won't budge. Soma, as the leader of the Auron Society, announces that they share the same aspiration as their goddess, to protect everyone's peace from the monsters. Even though he is well aware that Thaku can defeat the Minotaur with his pinky finger, he considers him an ordinary person. And so, he lives up to the ideals of their group, leading Thaku watching him try to eliminate the monster by himself. At that moment, Soma apologizes for forcing Thaku to reveal his power. Flashing wide a smile, he confesses that he wants to be strong, just like his heroine. Shifting to another flashback, four years ago Soma, as a first-year junior high school student, was announced as a winner in a sparring match. He mocked his opponent for being a hunter and yet, couldn't even make him break a sweat. The other hunters talked about him for being a child prodigy, and how he suffered defeat only at the hands of the head of the clan. His father called him out for being so smug and self-satisfied. He told his son not to look down on his opponents, and that just having the skills would not get him anywhere. As he would always remind him, having true strength is one who protects and guides people correctly with an unbreakable heart against all odds. Tired of hearing his father's lectures he had already memorized, Soma left the dojo early. Following his narrative, he was obsessed with getting compliments. Aside from getting praise for his talent, he has always lived a privileged life. With a silver spoon in his mouth and a good-looking face, he never had to worry about money and girls. Life was easy, at least for him. As he walked down the streets after skipping training because he found it boring, he came across a black gate. Apparently, both the hunter party and the rescue team have yet to come out of the gate. The people feared that it wouldn't take long until the monsters emerged. Soma, lacking experience in actual combat, took his chance and jumped straight to the gate. Some concerned citizens expressed their worry for the kid, but the authorities could only wait for an A-rank hunter to appear. Speaking of which, a girl with a ribbon tied to her hair arrived at the scene. She then asked everyone to step back away from the gate. Soma's excitement was quickly replaced by fear when he ran into a powerful monster, cutting down a human into pieces. Unable to bear the gruesome sight he threw up, and before he knew it, he was next in line. Luckily, the young Sakura arrived to save him. She apologized for being late and promised him that she would end the monster in a trice. Despite the disadvantage in number, Sakura leaped over the monsters. Paralyzed with fear, Soma still couldn't move. For the second time, Sakura saved him from dying a horrible death. However, the monster managed to scathe her back. Soma went frantic, but even with a deep wound, Sakura smiled at him as she felt glad he was fine. Continuing where she left off, she vowed to end the battle in a flashy manner. There and then, Soma remembered his father's words as he admitted to himself that he was weak. After defeating the monsters, she reached out her hand, and they escaped the gate together. Back to the present, the grown-up Soma notes that he wants to become stronger so as not to feel ashamed of himself if he fights alongside his heroine one day. His battle with the Minotaur continues, but then his resolve is not enough. He couldn't penetrate the monster's defense, and it even landed a solid hit on his face. Forced to be on the defensive, Soma knows he is facing an A-rank monster, but whatever caused the mutation baffles him. Thaku intervenes, and Soma immediately tells him to stay back. As he insists that his spear is unbreakable, Thaku alerts him that neither his weapon nor his skill is the problem. He says that Soma is being too delicate. He reminds him that he's not facing a human but a monster. With a single tap on Soma's shoulder, Thaku calls upon the dormant magical power within him. He makes it clear that the power boost is only temporary, and its effects will make him suffer later once it's over. Thanks to the buff, Soma ends his long-standing battle with the Minotaur in a flashy manner. Seconds later, he crashes to the ground. While he endures the excruciating pain, Thaku notices a small black creature on the ground, seemingly trying to escape. He steps on the strange thing and looks at it closely. Elsewhere, Orochi is seen with a mysterious girl, as he watches Thaku through a snake's eyes. It appears that Orochi was behind the sudden appearance of the Cyclops and the Minotaur. The girl adds that it's a pity that the monsters were defeated even after they were made strong. Orochi assures her that he will definitely get Thaku next time. As he puts it, even if he is above an S-rank hunter, he still has a weakness as a human. Holding his picture, he warns Thaku that he is coming for him. Like a wild animal kept inside a cage, Thaku is being escorted to his final destination. In every corner of the street, he hears the people screaming for his immediate execution, the same people used to praise his courage and bravery, thanking him for always protecting them.
but sadly that was just a thing of the past. As he relives the traumatic event, he finally wakes up from the bad dream, gasping for breath. While having breakfast, Thaku thinks about the summer break approaching. He plans to meet with Kikeo during that time. As a man of his word, Soma has already made the necessary arrangements for it to happen. Unlike other Isekai characters, he's determined to return the body he possesses to its owner, even if it costs him his own life. For someone who experienced death twice, he convinces himself that disappearing should be the least of his worries. Seeing their son listless, his parents ask if he's okay. His mother even suggests they take him to the hospital. He immediately explains that he just had a bad dream. Seeing his parents extremely worried about him gives him all the more reason to find a way to get his body back to Kusanagi. In the end, no matter how much he spelled out that he was fine, he was brought back to the hospital. After the checkup, Thaku received a message from Sawa, wishing for his quick recovery. The same goes with Soma and the rest of his members, who even sent him a group photo. From one weird bunch to another, he chanced upon the wind guard party, with Yuchai rushing to cover Mamoru's loud mouth. Thaku greets them, and shares that he saw the news about them after the incident. Nevertheless, he's glad that they seem fine. Yuchai then mentioned they had just been discharged today. While Thaku wonders if Chika didn't really say a word about him to his comrades, Matsuri asks her why she's being fidgety all of a sudden. Refusing to make eye contact with Thaku, she announces that she just feels happy. After that, she quickly asks them to head out of the hospital. Seeing how Chika reacted around Thaku, Mamoru approached him. For the first time, he modulates his voice as he tells Thaku that he's been friends with his party members since childhood. Growing up in Kazami City, they promised to protect it until that fateful day arrived, and they failed miserably. Clenching his fist, he promises to himself that next time, it's going to be him and not Thaku, who will save his friends in the city. Again the latter acts as if he has no idea what he's talking about. Back with his ear-piercing voice, Mamoru laughs it off and tells Thaku that if he finds himself in trouble, he will be there for him no matter what. 